And welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, but we are streaming live around the world at our website, KFAR660.com. I am your host, Steve Floyd, the kind of the monkey behind the machine as far as that goes. I'm just here to make sure that the right buttons get pushed in the right order. You're joining us in the studio today from Bighorn Enterprises, one of the sponsors of the show when performance matters. It's Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning, Steve. And from the other sponsor of the show, Four North Tactical, over there at the corner of 8th and Lacey, getting you prepared for the zombie apocalypse. Here is Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Mr. Good Bennett. morning, Steve. And also, we've got our favorite arachno capital actually, excuse me, that's anarcho-capitalist, uh, Dave Giesel. Good morning. Morning, Steve. And good to have you guys here. Uh, is that the applause in the background? All right, uh, Dave, you are getting ready to get out of here. Uh, and leave the the uh, the prison, I guess you could Woo-hoo, say. Here, your, yeah. your sentence is uh, all right. Going to a different, different prison. Up, right? Uh, so different scenery. Yeah, different prison. It's uh, same rules though, isn't it? Pretty much mm-hmm. similar. Actually, uh, yeah, I'm moving to Canada. Canada actually gives you a five year tax holiday if you move there, not on Canadian income but on global income. So if you move there and you take your brokerage account or whatever and you transfer it to um, a Canadian brokerage, you don't pay capital gains or anything on it for five years. Well, that sounds like a pretty good deal compared to what we've got going in the United States right now. They're trying to make it so that they can tax you on any income you make anywhere in the world. It's good until year five, which is why you keep moving on. (laughs) Oh, so you're going to move to Canada for a while. Well, yeah, you can always move your assets after five years. Where is your else. Where is your loyalty? Dude? Yeah, I know. That's where is it? it? Mm. Honestly, mm. just how were you raised? Somewhere just beneath the surface of my skin. You sound like this guy from Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I wish I don't have that much money yet. One okay. day. And you're talking about the uh, Zuckerman or that other guy? The uh, we got it rolled. Uh, Eduardo, Eduardo, the foreigner. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the one that we have to tax ten years back and counting. And why stops there? Chuck Schumer wants to, anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, so much of what you talk about, Dave, when it comes to your assets and not being taxed, it just seems like you're so fixated on money. Is that all you care about? Just It's money. easier to haul around than stuff. So people are like, some people are really comfortable uh, buying a large piece of property. You know, they're like, well, how are you going to deal with inflation and a volatile world situation? Like, well, I'm going to buy a big piece of land. That makes some people comfortable. They, exactly the opposite for me. Because if you move, how do you take your land with you? You you don't. How do you take your house with you? You don't. Um, So money's a lot easier to move around. Of course, it's not totally easy to move around, but it's easier. It's also easier to divide up. Say you have a piece of land, 40 acres, and a big house, and you want to diversify that internationally. Well, first of all, you can't move it, but even if you tried to, there's no way you could move, you know, a quarter of it to Switzerland and a quarter of it to Mexico and a quarter of it to Argentina and a quarter of it to Australia or something. It's a big hunk of land in the ground, and it's already within the uh, the borders that, that your home country claims. So from a diversification standpoint, I am absolutely terrified at the idea of owning a huge plot of land, you know, a farm I can grow enough food to feed myself on. Um, I think that's just a, for me... It's a crazy idea, but it makes some people very comfortable, and so for some people, that's probably the right choice, but not well, for me. Yeah, and tell me, wrap my mind around it, because you know, historically speaking, I mean, if you look at how people have fed themselves and fed their families, uh, if you've got assets, it doesn't. It's really not a problem in terms of buying what you need, unless that's right. Unless uh, the the, per, the place where you live doesn't accept what you have as currency. Yeah. So that's. But if you have you have currency, if you don't see that coming, um, <laughs> then you have another problem altogether. <laughs> I mean, if you can't see the doors closing, you have a different problem. Um, but let's say you got that big plot of land. What's you know one of the most contested regions in China over the last 5,000 years? It's the, it's the farming region out, out uh, west. There's been many, many, many more wars fought in the farming regions of China than in the coastal regions, historically. So if it got really bad, yeah, you wouldn't really want to farm. Plus, I can wake, I can make way more money doing other things than farming. And if I can make money, then I can feed myself. Far easier than farming. I'm just not into farming. I don't like to work. <laughs> That's why I got a college degree. Oh, man. Wow. You're just making all kinds of digs this morning. Right? No, but I mean, that's why you do it. It's a trade-off, right? You invest in yourself. You take time out of your life or you're foregoing income. 
and the payoff is income on the other side, more income on the other side. Well, theoretically, Other, I mean, that you look at theoretically, all, all, if you got a degree in underwater basket weaving, uh, the demand for that's pretty low. But if you know how to do something useful, let's say you know how to weld, right? There's a manual skill, right? Welders are needed in shipyards all over the world. You can make a lot more money welding than you can farming, and you can take it anywhere with you. You can't take your land with you. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your grain silo with you. Is underwater basket? Yeah, you can't, we can't, we can't hear you <laughs> there, Aaron. You got to get close to the microphone when you're going to. He's wondering if underwater basket weaving is a real degree. He's, I, I have disturbed about it. I haven't seen it at close. UAF, but uh, well, it's, we're not a very coastal. It's, it's school. close, it's actually, because yeah. I, I got my bachelor of arts in interdisciplinary humanities. Okay. Which is pretty close to underwater basket weaving. It's like a major in electives, right? Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's for those who don't know what they want to be when they grow up. And I managed yeah. to cram a four-year degree into five and a half years. And on the other end, I realized that the only thing I was qualified to do was to go back to school. Right. right. So well, it, yeah, and there's you know there's all sorts of ways to learn a useful skill. You don't need to go to college or something like that. There's, yeah. We've talked about apprenticeships and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can just go out and do stuff. The point is, for me, living out in the woods, picking berries in the fall, hoping I survive through the winter, that is not a long-term feasible strategy for me. It doesn't get me diversified. It gives me no latitude in where I can travel when I want to travel, and it puts me into a... Um, survivalist scraping by existence, which if I think things are going to get worse and I'm barely surviving, mm, that's not a comfortable situation for me. If I think things are going to get worse and I'm doing really well and I got some property in a couple different places in the world and I have enough money to travel and I have enough money to feed myself, I'm going to feel a lot better. And you're selfish. <laughs> well, you know, actually, though, I mean, I've, in, in a very real way, I mean, people who have large families or other ties in terms of uh, having other mouths to feed, they, they're automatically restricted nope. from from a lot of that travel, aren't they? Nope. Only if they think so. Have you tried to travel with a big family, Dave? No, I haven't. Josh has done it. You can do it. Came up here with nothing, with a huge family. I travel my kids back and forth to see me... Um, three or four times a year. You know, they stay with me pretty much half the year, but there's a lot of traveling involved to make that happen. Yeah, we Beverly hillbillied it up here now. I started thinking about that. Jumped in the old semi truck through the camp around the back, through my wife, and I don't know, I'm, I can't remember how many kids we have. They're like everywhere. Back the day after we moved, the day after we got to Anchorage, Alaska, she had Israel. Yeah, our fourth one. So, yeah, we only had three. But Did yeah. you have a big uh, pile of cash before you moved? No. Did you have an awesome, sweet job lined up up here when you moved? Nothing. So how on earth is that even possible? That was It was hard. We came up here. I mean, Aaron remembers. You came up right before us, right? We uh, lived in the camper out uh, some, I think it was Centennial a... Centennial Campground. Centennial Campground for a few months. I finally got a job, uh, pushed a broom for... Three or four months with a guy, and then ended up uh, driving a dump truck for him, which paid pretty good, but not what I wanted. So I saved up for another couple months working on that job and bought the dump truck from the guy. That was 12 years ago now, I think. Now I own 40 some, way too many trucks. And <laughs> no, but yeah, no college degree or anything. No, you just you have a useful goodness. skill and you're willing to work. So yeah. if you go to if you go to an area of the world that's not and you came up here because of opportunity, right? Right. So if perceived. You're, if you're moving to an area of the world where there's uh, opportunity, well, there's more here than Idaho, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not a problem if you know how to work. If you don't want to work, there's a lot of incentive to just sit and tread water until until uh, you can't tread water anymore. But uh, that goes back to the whole thing where you said, you know, as long as they take your money, you're, we're trying to look ahead of the curve. Not not behind it. Or right. you get smart enough that you don't have to work. Yeah, that's the other angle. You could well, just I mean, run. You could just run for office, and you wouldn't have to. Worry, <laughs> wouldn't have to work, and, and you, you don't even have to be smart that's for evil that. Evil enough, so you, you, can, you can take everybody else's money. Yeah, you know? it is. Uh, that's pretty interesting. I didn't go to college, but uh, I guess someone texted me a while back, and they said you can't teach people entre- entrepreneurship. And I'm trying. I've been thinking about that. It's only been four or five days, but I still haven't decided on that yet. You know what? I think I think you're right. I think you can't teach entrepreneurship, but you can catch it. I mean, yeah. it, it's like an infection. If somebody is around somebody else who's an entrepreneur who takes risks, who is willing to put it all on the line and go out there and try something new, 
uh, then it, it is. It's catching. People are like, oh, I could do that. He he can do. He's he he can do that. That big old lunkhead. I can <laughs> yeah, do that. Exactly. Then I can do that. Do, do, do. <laughs> Berwick, uh, Jeff Berwick, who we've had on the show before, he didn't go to college. Mm-hmm. He went to his first marketing class. His mom was like, you really need to go to college because it's important. So he went to his first marketing class, and he's like, this guy's an idiot. Walked out, started his company, uh, Stockhouse.com, in Canada. <laughs> It grew to be worth 125 million bucks. He sold it, and he hasn't had to work since then. So he's doing his thing now in Mexico. He's doing Dollar Vigilante because he wants to, and because he has. Uh, for him, you know, it's rewarding to see a business be successful and grow. So, just to satisfy himself, he's um, started that business down there. Yeah, it <clears throat> it is rewarding. It's fun. Yeah, but I but I mean that goes back, uh, you know, to tie it back to the whole uh, the whole leaving thing. Again, like. You know, being in the woods, that's totally cool. If people want to be in the woods and pan gold and pick berries, that's totally fine. But, uh, you know, don't expect that to bring you to a place where you're going to be, where you're going to have a whole bunch of freedom in terms of the ability to travel and do all these things. It's like Molyneux talked about uh, on the show a few weeks ago. Exactly. You know, if you are worried about the state and you're sick of taxation and all this because it's keeping you from keeping your money. And so you move move out into abject poverty, but you're free of the state. Uh, you've done it in reaction to the state. You haven't, you know, won or shown them anything. You've just kind of admitted defeat. And, and how free are you really? I mean, <laughs> yeah, how in, much freedom? You know, how much freedom do you have? You're like, oh, there's no freedom to travel. You know, so I'm I'm never going to get on a plane again because they grope me and scan me. You can go alternately to any country in the world except the United Kingdom, and fly and not get groped. You could do that. Or you could, you know, say, oh, I'm only going to drive from now on, but darn it, I'm going to stay in America. So, but that's a decision that people have to make. I, I'm, I'm, my, I've got several ideas bouncing around, uh, around in my head right now, David, based on some of the things you've said, like uh, that concept of America, love it or leave it. Uh, oh, oh, uh, can we, can you take that one? Okay, um, go my, ahead. My friend and I have come up with something that we tell people. So, like, I'll tell somebody I'm leaving, and they're like, oh, why would you leave? This is the best country on earth. So the retort to that that's really fun is. Okay, if you think that, you should never be allowed to leave. People are really uncomfortable when you tell them that if they think that, they should never be allowed to leave. Because that's what they're trying to tell you. How dare you leave? You shouldn't be allowed. So when you turn that question around on them, but, but that's they, ex- they are that, very uncomfortable. But that's exactly them. what they've done right now. They've introduced legislation that will yeah. strip you of your passport if you owe taxes. Well, I, I've always been uh, this is kind of humorous to me that people actually worry about that. I mean, what do they care if you want to leave? I mean, but people really yeah. do think. I've talked to people about the same thing. They go, well, why would why you? It's worse everywhere else. I mean, that's why do you don't go? That's dumb. Blah, blah. What do you care? I mean, what's why is that bothering you so much that? I mean, well, you just don't love America enough, or blah. Why does that bother people? I haven't figured that out. That's Who cares? The con, it's the consensus thinking. By yeah. you leaving, you're removing part of the consensus, well, and that makes them very scared. Exactly. It removes part of the legitimacy of the whole idea of taking from other people, because now they're, they're saying, you're saying you can't take from me anymore. <laughs> that, and they're thinking, obviously, in the back Do of their mind. Do you know something mind. I don't? Exactly. <laughs> that's, all it ha- that's what it has to be. In the back of their mind, they're going, oh, gee, it's got to be. Nagging I, down I there, know. this guy might be right and I might be wrong. What if there is something better? Or maybe they just don't want. Maybe people are so selfish they just don't want you to have something better, so they don't want you to leave. If they were, if somebody's totally comfortable with their situation, they're not gonna be upset about you doing whatever. True. You know, as long as you're not transgressing against them. So I think there's a lot of people who aren't comfortable, who have like some sort of sense deep down that things are not the way that they are told they are. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that cognitive dissonance. That, yeah, it that, brings it right to the fore. That somehow, I mean, you, you know in the back of your mind that what is happening is wrong, but you've been told that it's right, mm-hmm. and so you go ahead and you go along with it, and you don't stand up against it, and you don't do anything to stop it. You participate basically along with what you know deep down inside is wrong, and it creates that cognitive dissonance where what you know is not matching up with what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope yeah. I hope that Dave even will uh, encourage other people to do it. At least start thinking about it. Or, you know, go someplace, yeah. take a take a trip. You know, people Explore are people are bit. hoarding their money, and you know that's probably a good thing to do if you don't know the future. You know, save some money, buy some gold or silver or something. But you can also invest in your knowledge of the world. It's a, a really useful thing to do. 
Yeah. I mean, especially if you have kids, people are like, well, things are going to get really bad and, you know, it's going to be the point where we might get marched away into internment camps. But I have a family, so I can't leave. I want to really make sure that my kids are marched off to that camp with me. <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah, wow. It, that, you know, the, you, that, that leads to that other issue of how free are you. And, and you seem to link that, that freedom to the, to the ability to travel or, or to the ability to buy and sell things. But isn't, uh, I don't know, that just, to me, it doesn't seem like that's the, all there is to freedom. No, no. I mean, freedom is, is a super generic word. It encompasses a whole bunch of things. But if you can't afford to do anything uh, because you're living in an economy that's going down the toilet, does it matter if they'll let you do anything? You know, if you can't afford to buy an airplane ticket, does it does it matter if they're going to let you leave or not? Because mm-hmm. at that point, you can't anyway. I saw um, there was a thing on Doug Casey that a friend of ours um, wrote me an email about, and he said, well, is the way what he took after at the end of it, what he took away was that Casey was saying, liberty means being able to make more money. And he was like, ah, is that all it means? Rah, rah, rah. And obviously he missed the point, but that is one of the points, is the freer you are, the easier it should be for you to not only make wealth, create wealth, keep it. Yeah, money's just a that's, substitute that's for a, it's just a substitute for property. Right. You know, if you sell your house and you get a hundred thousand dollars or whatever, the hundred thousand dollars represents the value that you had in the house. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, being able to keep your money is just equivalent to saying you can keep your property. But that that presupposes property rights. Aaron, were you gonna say something about that issue of property? No, not about property. I was gonna say something about you guys were talking earlier about the entrepreneurialism, and whether you can teach it or not. I wonder in a free market a totally free market where everybody has an equal opportunity, how much more entrepreneurism there would be and how much of it's stifled by the very system that we live in. Is it really so much that so many people aren't interested in that or don't have that in them naturally to be that way, or is it the hurdles you have to go over? I mean, look, think about the guy that owns the, the Dutch dealership and all the people that work for him. Is any all those people that you know detail the vehicles and things of that nature... Are they so much less than him uh, mentally that they can't own a similar business? Or is it, think about the hurdles they have to go through to get there. And how many of those are government instituted in um, stagnating the free market in the first place? Huge. Yeah, it introduces a whole different level of risk. I mean, the only entrepreneurs out there now are the ones who can take huge risk. Because just, I mean, Steve's talked about this before, just setting up a basic business, you got to get all the licenses, you got to get all the insurance, you got to jump through a million hoops. So there's a huge cost to entry. And so just right from day one, you're taking a big risk because the initial investment to start a business is a lot higher. And if you go out and you invest the, all the money and try to get it done and you don't have all your permits lined up, what happens? Well, I think um, the fact that I still have a tattoo shop sitting there with crickets playing violins is kind of living proof to what happens. Yeah, <clears throat> it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't well, that, matter how much you play the game. They can still shut you down. So really, the, what you're saying is we do not actually have property rights. Because if somebody else has the right to come in and tell you what to do with your property, if they're telling you, sorry, Aaron, even though you have some great tattoo equipment, you can't use it. You can't have anybody in your shop. You can't actually give anyone a tattoo. Then what's the purpose of having that stuff? You don't, it, it's, it's as if you don't own it. Well, hypothetical. I mean, statement here, but what are you uh, what are you allowed to do with your rifle? You allowed to use it? That's a good question. Because I mean, everybody else, you know, everybody jumps out. Oh, of course you're allowed to use it. You can go out hunting anytime you want to. You have the right to have it. Can, can you go hunting anytime you want to? As no. long as you obey all the regulations yeah, I mean, it's and just hunt a, where they tell you you can. Yeah. I mean, it's a permission centric society. So, and you don't have, well, you always have the right to do what you want. It's just there's different consequences. I mean, that's the whole deal. We talk about uh, state-free society or, you know, you can use the anarchy word if you really want to scare people. But anybody out there can do whatever they want whenever they want. They're just going to have to deal with consequences. And so that's the nature of existence, right? There's nothing stopping, you know, somebody from walking into Fred Meyer with a gun and killing everybody except for the, except for the consequences. And... Uh, the state, through regulation, introduces a whole set of consequences for peaceful transaction. You know, starting a business. You're totally peaceful. You're not harming anybody. And the state says, if you do that, we'll lock you in a cage. 
Right, but the argument for that is um, that's why we need government. I mean, you're basically making a good case for the government. I had a person ask me almost the same question today, spun the other way, right? And my reply to that was, I mean, the the common law itself takes care of, um, um, keeps a person from going in and shooting everybody in a supermarket, like you were just saying, where the government actually promotes that kind of conduct. I mean, take something like rape, for example. There's like 14 different types of rape. So, okay, for for a, a, a girl that's under 12 years old, there's like seven different types of ways that I could violate her according to the paper laws that are out there. I wonder if that girl feels any less or more violated depending on the degree of rape that I just committed. So wow. when, when our legislator went out and created these different degrees of rape, right? I know it's a touchy subject, but there's, if you look in the statute book at how many degrees there is, it's disgusting. There's only one type of rape, the one where you're violating another person's individual liberty. So we've taken it from committing a crime to different degrees that you violated the state, right? I mean, the state no. sets up all these different degrees that they feel you committed a worse and worse and worse crime. See, now my mind is going right back to what we were talking about earlier with the TSA, because I certainly feel violated. I, and and oh, yeah. you know, in, in my mind, if some guy walked up to me on the street and touched me in the way in which they touch you when you go through the TSA line, I would treat that as if he had just raped me. Well, that's another thing you get with uh, statutory law, like Aaron was talking, which is um, asymmetry of application. The rules never apply to the rulers. The rules never apply to the ruling class. If if you put a blue light on top of your car and drive around flashing it behind people, um, what are what are they supposed to do? Get out of your way. Pull over. Yeah, yeah. Submit. But if you do it, and a guy in a fancier car with cooler lights that are also blue sees you doing it, what does he do? <laughs> Gets you in a cage. <laughs> right. Well, I, so, you know, I was just thinking about that the other day. I, I was watching. I was out for a run, and I saw a couple of troopers go speeding through a red light. Mm-hmm. With their their sirens wailing and their lights flashing, and they basically they came up, then whoop 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 whoop. They slowed down a little bit. They they just went right through the red light, and then they took off on the other side. And they were just, I mean, they were screaming, going really fast. And I was thinking to myself, I wonder what it would be like if they had to obey the same laws that we do when they're going out to apprehend someone who is. Well, in theory, they're going to apprehend somebody, but you don't know. They could have just been going home. That, you know, I, I've it, seen that happen when I lived in Anchorage a lot. Yeah. It happened with the mayor of Houston, Alaska. Okay. The guy who came up here to Fairbanks to drop off a, a patrol car. And what he did on his... Do you remember this story? No. On his way up here, he turned on the lights and the siren, and he went super fast. Yeah. And he passed a whole bunch of people that pulled over for him. And the only reason anybody found out about it is that there was that automatic recording device that kicked on every time he turned on his lights. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so somebody was looking at him like, what? what is the mayor of Houston doing driving this? Co-? And basically it was a misuse of his office, and I believe he got recalled for it. Oh, yeah. But still. Surprising. But Strange. It is. It is surprising. Why would they do that? But you get, yeah, I mean, you get that whole thing. Congress and, uh, and the president, guess who's immune from Social Security? Congress. Those guys. And the president. Guess who's, you know, they're immune from a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, they have immunities from all sorts of uh, taxes and uh, programs that everyone else is forced to pay into. Pay I think into. they... So that's, I yeah, mean, that's Every just law the, they pass, I don't think they're subject to any of them. It depends on, you know, what what position they're in. The president can order torture and all sorts of stuff. Depends so, on so, the, so the meaning get, of the word is. You, is. Hmm. Right. So you get all sorts of asymmetry once you get past uh, common law, like Aaron was talking about. And you get all these crimes, you know, talk going back to the business thing. You get all these crimes that you get locked in a cage in or fined for that you're not violating anybody's rights. You know, what if what if you find somebody who wants to clean your house for 10 bucks a day, you know, and they think that's agreeable. So you hire them to do it Well, you're violating all sorts of OSHA laws. Probably you're not paying a minimum wage. Um, you know, they might be from a, a different tax farm and not have the right pieces of papers. You might be hiring an illegal immigrant. <laughs> And it's just something you both agreed to. It works for you, and it works for them, and uh, and the state will lock you away for it. See, now you're spinning me off into thinking about marriage, because isn't it, isn't that the same kind of an issue where you, you decide that you want to enter into a relationship with someone, and 
if you don't decide to do it the right way, the state tells you that you're breaking the law? Yeah, there's actually a term for that. I mean, the state makes itself a third party in all contracts. Right. And so you have this this contract, which would just be an agreement between the, the signatories to the contract. And the state says, no, 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 you can't choose your own terms and agree to them on your own. Uh, we're going to be a third party. But we're not going to be an arbiter in the sense that if one party violates the other, we're going to co- uh, compensate the violated party. We're going to be an arbiter in the sense that if you violate our rules, we are going to take from the person who is violated to pay for you to be locked in a cage. There's no compensation or anything. So, Whereas uh, the way an arbiter would work, of course, is they would take a small fee to settle a dispute and the injured party would get compensated. Isn't that great? <laughs> so you get to be this third party. You come into something that's none of your business, but you make it your business because you decide to make these rules. And you get and paid. Say, you get paid for every contract. Because yeah. don't you have to have a license? Yeah, and, you have to pay for that marriage license, I'm pretty sure. I don't know because I don't have one. Business, but, business license? You have to have a business license if you're going to be... Legal. Oh, yeah, I've got lots of those. Commercial city. driver's license. I mean, you Endorsements. Get, Every time you get an endorsement, they charge you more. You get taxed for all the enforcement agencies. Go out and try to sell food without having the right license and see what happens. Oh, yeah, there. so on leaving, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, Amish who are going down. I think they're moving down to Paraguay. Yeah. There were a bunch who moved down there in, long ago um, in the 40s or 50s, and there's a bunch who are moving down there now because they're getting busted for selling raw milk without an FDA-approved... Uh, License or whatever. Yep. So well, I mean, it's smoke. a good thing too because so many people are dropping dead from drinking. Yeah, that raw, that raw milk, milk. Uh, epidemic that's going around. It's pretty rough. All right, we're coming up on the Fox News here at the bottom of the hour. Stay with us. If you'd like to get a hold of the show, what's the email address? It's patriotslament at gmail dot com, and, and the blog is patriotslament dot blogspot dot com. All right, stay with us. We'll be back in just a few moments right here on KFAR's local talk radio, KFAR six six zero dot com. All right, and welcome back to the Shed in Your Morning Wake Up Call right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, 660 on your AM dial. We were just talking about this issue of raw milk and the Amish farmers who have been uh, basically forced uh, out of the country. I, I don't know how else to describe it, really. I mean, they're they're leaving the country now, and I mean, you had armed armed men. Coming in to the end to try to shut down these Amish farmers, who, as we all know, I mean, they're they're notorious for being what, like, radically violent, violent, oh, violent oh, criminals. All through history, you know, violent. peddling that raw milk out there, getting the kids hooked on it, and the next thing you know, they've got the uh, the the gang fights between the Amish gangs. There's little buggies in the Amish drive-by. Amish and the Quakers. Oh yeah, they you know, like, <laughs> Oh man, you get the Mennonites wrapped up in it then, and it is just a throwdown. Well, I heard what they do is they kidnap little kids and they get their syringes out and like shoot them up with raw milk, and they're like hooked. So, so they just keep coming all back it takes, to buy all more. it takes is one more. time of raw milk, and you are hooked, man. They gotta it have is, more. Uh, <laughs> they gotta have more. So, but seriously, though, I mean, this the idea that somehow the government has decided that raw milk is illegal, and the Amish ha- are leaving. We got a phone call here, four five eight. Talk the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Josh. How's it going, guys? Hey, hey Josh. Good. Thanks for calling in. Uh, now, did you have something to add on this raw milk issue? Yeah, I actually, I use it as a baseline for my interactions with people. Um, I call it the raw milk test, or just the milk test. Um, and whenever I meet someone new, and I know they're like way different from me politically, I can tolerate a lot of nonsense, like uh, they're pro drone strike, or they're pro welfare, or they're pro all these terrible things. But where I draw the line, where I know I'll never be able to interact with them as a, as a human being, is uh, is when they want to throw me in prison for drinking raw milk. So like I use it as a baseline. When, I, when I'm suspicious that someone might be just a terrible, terrible fascist, I'm like, hey, what do you think about raw milk? And if they're like, yeah, we think if people drink milk straight from a cow, they should be shot and thrown in prison, or shot and or thrown in prison. Um, I just, I'm done with them. Like, totally cut them off. And I've actually been exercising this quite a bit, and I'm totally happy with the results. Like, I can tell you, like, when I started doing this, it's been like five months, I think. Um, Bad people are not as frequent in my life. Like, I've just stopped interacting with them. People would really frustrate me. Like, and the way I see it is if you, if you're talking to someone, and you're trying to interact with them, communicate. And they're like, yeah, I want to throw you in prison for drinking milk. You just, you're, they're done. You can't do anything with them. It's just a waste of time. So, so truthfully, I mean, for real, you've had people say that? Absolutely. One of my former roommates, one of my former friends, actually. I've, I have removed people from my life who I interacted with quite a bit, old friends, like from college and stuff. And they just, it got to the point where I'm like, I, I was just flabbergasted. And um, he's like, well, you know, it's just, it's so dangerous. Like everyone, people die. And he'd pull up a story about two people 
being uh, dying from raw milk or something. I'm like, well, let's look at Europe. Let's look at the entire continent of Europe where they drink raw milk. Not all of them, you know, but it's pretty standard in Europe. And let's see how many of them are. Is it, is Europe, Europe still exists? Is it still populated by billions of people? And he's like, well, burr, 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 burr. you know, just no answer to that. But yeah, absolutely. I've had this conversation with, you know, college educated adults who are totally cool with gun toting, you know, thugs coming into some hippies, you know, raw food store and, you know, and pouring his milk down the drain like it's 1940s booze or something. But yeah, now these weren't ignorant people. I mean, ignorant in the common use of the word. These were educated adults. Wow. Telling me they wanted to shoot me in the face for drinking milk. And how much better is your life? I mean, we've talked about this before. I know I've had this conversation with you and with Dave. I'm sure you've talked with Dave and with Steve and Aaron. We've all talked about um, associating with people that do want to throw you in jail. I mean, how much self-respect do you have for yourself when you're going to hang around people and give people part of your time, your life, or whatever, knowing all along that they would not have a problem pointing a gun at you and throwing you personally in jail? Like, we like to pretend that politics are it's kind of like sports, you know? Like, if I like the Dodgers and you like the Rams or something, you know, we can pretend go back and forth and make fun of each other, razz each other a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's just sports. You know, we don't really we don't really get into this case too much. Right. We're you know, not we may like, oh, I hate that guy. He likes he likes the Dodgers or whatever. But then we do that with politics too. Like, so we get we get a little bit more mad. Most people, I say we, I mean the average American. Yeah. Like all oh, those damn liberals, rah rah rah. But um. But in the end, it's, it doesn't affect our daily lives. But unlike sports, you know, like. No one's going to shoot someone in the face over the Packers. Well, I hope not anyways. <laughs> but when you're advocating for, you know, raw milk laws, if I were to go find a cow and then milk it and then exchange it to you for $5, you know, a cop could theoretically come up to me and say, hey, you know, to do that. I'm taking you to prison. I'm like, no, I just handed this guy milk. Bam. Or, you know, handcuffs, whatever the yeah. whatever handcuffs is. So, I mean, and that's just, that's my minimum line. If you're doing that, I mean, there's a lot of other things I think is totally intolerable, you know, drug war. A million other things, but I have to draw the line somewhere as long as I'm in America, unfortunately. And I decided that raw milk was the was the do not cross line. So I'm just flabbergasted that you have actually separated yourself from people because you've actually run into people that want to throw people in jail for. Yeah, raw milk. it's not some like silly little intellectual thing I do. It's an effective test at weeding out people who are bad for my life. Jeez. You know, Josh, one of the things that I'm, I've, I've encountered along those same lines is that people who don't necessarily see anything inherently wrong with drinking raw milk or with selling raw milk, but because the government passed a law against it, they basically believe that you must obey the law no matter what the law is. Right. And, and no matter how stupid it is, no matter how flying in the face of reason it is, no matter if they, I mean, if they passed a law that said you must levitate three eight feet off the ground, oh, you know what? I'm breaking the law. I'm going to have to turn myself in. They would do it. They yeah. would turn themselves in for not levitating if they did pass such a law. And yet, I mean, did, am I am I thinking correctly on this? Um, that this is a related issue that somehow that just because somebody made it a law that other people are now going to go along with it and and, and completely suspend their own sense of right and wrong and that somebody else tell them. Yeah, what well, is right and what is wrong? There's two groups there. There's I call them the rule people, people who think it's like a moral, moral imperative when they see a sign that says "Do not walk on the grass." Like, oh man, if I step on the grass, I'm a bad person. And they're just, I don't know. There's something different about their biology. They're just they need to follow rules. They need the structure imposed on them. I think they're also hopeless, but they're different than the people who, when they're told that you know there's a rule, they you know, like they actually intellectually defend it. They're the kind of, they're the same people who love FDR, even though he imprisoned a bunch of Japanese people because he fixed the economy. You know, they're they make everything right in their head just so it's okay with the state. Like when the state says don't drink milk, they'll come up with a million different reasons for why it's got to be the way it is. They're not like, it's the rule, we just got to follow the rule. That's the way it is. They're different. They're they're advocates of it. Yeah, law, law lends legitimacy for some reason, which boggles my mind. Right, exactly. That's what it is. They yeah. don't realize, for some reason, people can't sink into their brain that these people that make these rules or laws are no different than they are. Yeah. They're human beings deciding, well... Yeah, raw milk's bad, so we're going to... I mean, they're deciding, first of all, it, it, uh, wrongly, that raw milk is bad for you. And then, they, then they're going to decide that you can go to jail for participating in raw milk. And 
because it becomes law, it's automatically legitimate. And it's actually the opposite. It's totally illegitimate because oh, yeah. you can just get those same bunch of people the next go around, you know, two years later, if you get your right guy in, they can pass a law that says raw milk should be given to everyone. Mm-hmm. Mandatory yeah. injections in school. And then the same people that were pounding on you because you should go to jail for contributing to the raw milk uh, agenda, then they'll turn around and say, oh, well, we have to drink raw milk. Now the government says we must. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can literally take it down that road and see the law could be one way one day. Two years later, the right person gets in. The law's automatically opposite. And we're bred into our brains that that's legitimate, so we will follow either which way it's well, look right. At, look at right here in Alaska, the anti-texting law that was just passed. <laughs> I, I mean, you could literally have been driving down the street texting, which I think is a stupid thing to do because you're not paying attention, but it's just as stupid to be talking to somebody in the back seat or be yapping on your phone or be fiddling with your radio. I mean, when you're driving, you should be driving, right? Well, well I'm right. listening to 660. Well, uh, no, I mean, absolutely, Patriots you should lament, not be listening to Patriots Lament on the radio or, <laughs> or the Saturday morning wake-up call. Either one of those uh, absolutely off your list. Thing is this, though, that the very next day, you are now committing a crime if you did the same exact thing. And some people have in their mind that it, somehow there is the same thing, that it's equivalent between crime and sin. And, and so that they feel like they are somehow committing a sin if they break a law. And there are some people who want to go and make it illegal to do some things that would simply be sins but are not and, and crimes. And that, that law, the texting law, failed a couple times, correct? Yeah. In past legislatures, yeah. it's failed. So this, that means that it proves the absurd, excuse me, the absurdity of law, period, of... Yeah. of uh, political law because political law. they can try to pass something it doesn't pass and oh, well it's still okay to do it i mean it must not be morally wrong this is a good thing to do you can text while driving and it's fine because it's not against the law all of a sudden they finally get it through and now it's immoral to text while you're driving now it's bad right the political law is so stupid and yet we legitimize it. As soon as it becomes law, we say, oh, but my is, God. But is the problem with political law, it, I mean, I think there is a certain amount of problem with that, but isn't it really a deeper problem that people have no inherent sense anymore of what is right or what is wrong? They well, are constantly asking for someone to tell them. But they don't need to be told, though, because, like, with political law, we wait until someone tells us what's right or wrong. There are some laws that have always been right and always been where right and wrong has always been there. That's the difference between the natural law, common law, whatever you want to call it, and political law. You never know what's going to be okay for you to do tomorrow with political law. Right. With the natural law, you've known for hundreds of years. You shouldn't murder people. You shouldn't steal from people. And it's hard to know what law, <clears throat> what's right and wrong, but it's really easy to know. Um, it's impossible to know a statute law, and the reason is yeah, because impossible. we've kind of abolished, yeah. it's called the harm principle, and it's basically... You haven't done anything wrong until there's damages. And that used to be an essential component of law for forever, until semi-recently, where we basically abolished it. And that's, So what that means is you drinking milk is against the law because they say it's against the law, not because you've hurt somebody. So like you're talking about there's a lot of reasons why people are, um, why, it's, why it's crazy they're anti-raw milk. Another reason is because they think it's into their damn business. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Well, no, look, in, but look at what they've done. I know that you were studying... Uh, I don't know if you still are with uh, into being a lawyer. Mm-hmm. And look, but look at what they've done in law. You just brought up a good point where it used to be the harm thing. You know, no injured party, then there's nothing. Nothing was wrong. If there's no produce the injured party. But so this, if you couldn't this, produce the injured party, then you didn't commit a crime. But the so state the has state, made itself an right, injured party. When you go to court now, it says blah 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 versus state of Alaska. Mm-hmm. And it's and if you read the little bill, I haven't been arrested for a while, so I can't get this <laughs> verbatim. <laughs> But we'll have to I have used a, to be able to quote it. It's, we'll it, have to have a raw milk drinking party. It, it would uh-huh. say, you know, so and so. Now comes the state against so and so, who has de- uh, harmed the dignity, or I, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's basically they are saying, no, there is an injured party. It's the state. Mm-hmm. They've made themselves an injured party. So they've kind of corrupted it, but they've kind of tried to keep it in line with the way it used to be, but it's corrupted. Well, it's totally corrupted because you can't fight the state in court. The state isn't some person. The state is some imaginary entity with a lot of guns. So right. you're fighting the state's lawyer, you're fighting, you're arrested by a state's cop, but you're not, you didn't offend the state by drinking raw milk or purchasing raw milk. There's no crime done. There's no harm done. 
It's basically just a bunch of guys with guns or a bunch of rules down without your consent, and they're going to shoot you if you don't follow them. Yeah, if so you there's ask, no legitimacy there at all. If you ask produce the injured party, who do they who do they drag out? Yeah, when you drink milk, like when you ask, okay, so who did I offend here? And they, there's no one that you you can't face your accuser in court because no one was hurt. So I mean, the whole thing is a huge sham, especially, and that's the thing. There's a lot of uh, dogma mixed up with I'm going to use that word incorrectly, but there's a lot of false beliefs about drug war and stuff. So I can't use drug, drugs as an example when I try to cut people off. But with milk, there hasn't been decades and decades and decades of propaganda demonizing raw milk. It's a semi-recent thing. So um, if I can't convince someone to not shoot me if I drink raw milk, then they're basically hopeless because they haven't been indoctrinated like they have in the drug war or anything else. So, I mean, it's just it's a brand new issue, and people are already taking it at face value. The state's 100% correct. Even though no one's hurt, it's 100% consensual. People have been drinking raw milk for, you know, longer. They've been drinking probably almost anything else. So, I mean, but it's just, yeah. Well, and if if they can legislate the raw milk issue, can't they legislate absolutely anything at all? Like, I mean, what about breast milk? Can they come in and make it illegal for your wife to breastfeed your child? That's wrong. They have to arrest the baby. The baby's the one that's drinking it. Wow. I'm all for it. Let's get that passed. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a nutrition issue. We have to make sure that the child is getting the proper nutrition that the state has decided that child should be getting. We need to take that child and feed that child formula. Well, if you look at, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this, I think in the last week or two, the Senate actually had a bill up whether to, I think it was uh, Rand Paul, try to put an amendment into oh, one of these yeah. FDA bills to strip the FDA of firearms. And the amendment failed... 93 to 7, which is really interesting. That's the same amount, the same split, 93 to 7, mm-hmm. as the NDAA. So these people, I, I mean, you could read into that a little bit. They do have some sort of an agenda. They want themselves to be armed. But, I mean, food cops yeah. they can be armed? But look at the intellectual like uh, revelation there, I guess, is that you know there's a tie between, and there's a correlation between the NDAA the Indefinite Detention Act, and raw milk, and the state enforcing raw milk with guns. So, I mean, there's a connection there, and it's not, there's no, you know, there's no philosophical connection between milk and indefinite detection, detention. You'd think, but the, pro, you know, the connection is as a state, so it has nothing to do with your health. You know, someone should be able to look at those two numbers and see if they're exactly the same and say, huh, why are the same people voting for these two totally unrelated things? And then you have to find the connection. The connection oh, is state it's power. The, it's the Bilderbergs. Yeah. <laughs> that's, what it, that's, that's what it's doing. Right? Uh, too much Alex Jones uh, over there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you need to shut your radio off. At <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, that is, is a very good point. I, I'm almost positive it was 93 to 7 that that amendment was uh, defeated. And all it was was simply these guys from the Food and Drug Administration. That's all they are. They're food cops. Mm-hmm. And Rand Paul simply said, yeah, I don't really think they should be armed. And the rest of the Senate said, yeah, they should. We want all you of know, our good really, folks to be armed. You know, really, if you take away their guns, Josh, what you're doing is you're taking away their legitimacy. Because then what you're saying is they're not really agents of the state. <laughs> they don't really have the power and the full authority of the government to step in with them exactly. if they don't have so, their guns. So analyze that. Like, where does their authority come from, then? Does it come from the Constitution or the fact that they're elected, or does it come from their Glock? It you know, comes like from the end of their barrel. Oh, right. thank you, Mao Zedong. <laughs> that is, comes from the end that of the is barrel. a direct quote from um, Chairman Mao right there. Oh, he's a good guy, too. I think he only pff, barely killed 200 million people that was or all, something. That was, not, that no. was peanuts. I mean, we could probably... We're getting there. Uh, Did, uh, <laughs> won't be won't be long. Also, I don't know if you guys have seen that. the uh, It was quite recently... I don't remember... Uh, I don't remember exactly what agency, something to do with the education department, where they raided a home with shotguns because someone was late. A lady was delinquent on her uh, her school loans. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, they actually raided their home. So the education department is now has an enforcement agency that is armed. Mm-hmm. So, yep, and, and the thing about school loans, too, is it's one of the only types of debt that you can't bankrupt out of. So you take on this debt because society encourages you to go to college, you're... You're subhuman if you don't go to college to learn about, you know, English and um, underwater basket weaving. Exactly. And then, but the thing is, you can't discharge these, these loans, even though you know the interest rates could be very high or whatever. It's the only type of debt you really can't. I think maybe gambling debt you can't discharge either. But anyways, you can't get rid of this debt. Um, you can't ever. If you can't meet your payments, you can't meet your payments. All of a sudden, the cops come, you know, and get you. So I mean, it's it's a total, total claptrap, and no one's like, yeah. 
but you got to do it to be a yeah. good American. I thought there was something way back when, I mean, a little fuzzy here, about being imprisoned for failure to pay debts. Isn't that something to do with <laughs> debtors' prison? I thought that was made illegal a long time ago. No, it's Apparently not. not. Yeah. Well, you know, we're pretty good at uh, dredging up the old stuff from the Roman Empire, the the monarchs of Europe, and just kind of rehashing it and make it even better. Uh, th- th- let me ask both of you, Josh's here, one thing here. Uh, as we're looking at the, how everything old is new again, and we are <laughs> we're repeating history in so many ways, going back to the fall of Rome uh, and looking at the collapse of the Republic, do you think, honestly, that we are heading toward a dictatorship or toward chaos? Mm, I don't see how those two are any different. Yeah, those are interesting. I don't think, I think you'd have to have, I think we're looking at collapse. I mean, you were talking about the, uh, or we were just talking about the student loans. I think that's the next little bubble from what oh, I've been yeah. reading. Oh, yeah, student loans is the next bubble for sure. Yeah, bang trillion bucks right there, gone. Mm-hmm. So... I think it's going to be economic collapse. And I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. I really wish I did. I'd be rich. (laughs) I'd be gone. (laughs) Yeah, I'd be (laughs) We might all be gone. (laughs) But the, uh, I think we're we're looking at some sort of economic collapse. Even George Soros, I saw a few weeks ago, said that the uh, euro has three months. Less than three months. Yeah, three Mm -hmm. months, and it's over. So it's going to be interesting to see how that wave comes across to the United States. And this is... There's certain things. This is all a numbers game. If you don't, if you're yeah. skeptical, you can just look at, you know, debt to income ratios. You can look at, you GDP. know, people American. You know, the ratio of Americans in prison versus not in prison. You can just look at these numbers are there. And I mean, I'm not a what's the word? A poc- I'm not a populistic in my views or whatever. But I'm just looking at numbers and I'm seeing project. I can make projections about it, certain it things. You cannot continue on the current course without right. some kind of consequence. And and right. if again, you know, with another throwback to the Roman Empire. Really, the reason why the Roman Empire failed, and there were a whole bunch of symptoms, from the public circuses to the bread that was being handed out to the overextension militarily to the grabbing of territory that that could, they couldn't be sustained, it was basically the devaluation of the currency that brought down Rome, if you think about it. Well, it's mathematics. Math doesn't lie. I mean, this mathematically, this thing has to go boom. It has to end. I mean, we can't have this recurring debt with a fiat currency with nothing backing it, and we keep buying our own debt. Uh, yeah, that can't continue forever. So, unfortunately, it's going to collapse. I mean, I'm glad that part's going to collapse. But, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be very nice for people that are mm-hmm. dependent on it. Yeah, a state can can survive on pretty meager means. If you just look at North Korea, they've got a 100% police state, and it's not like they have a booming economy. So, I'm not exactly... <laughs> hoping the state will just fall apart and disintegrate and we'll all be happy and doing our own thing. <clears throat> Realistically, I think it'll get it'll get tight and it'll get nasty and it'll just take more of our money and well, look worse at, things with it. Look, look, I mean, Josh, you don't live here in, in Alaska. Oh, right? I do. No, this is... I'm there's there's, oh, there's, oh, there's a different Josh. There's, okay. got like 97, there's like a whole bunch of Joshes out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> all of think, them are brilliant, too. Think about, uh, think about the issue of the Alaska Permanent Fund Dividend <laughs> and how we have all become so accustomed to having that extra $1,000 a year put into our our bank accounts automatically that we know we're going to have that we can basically plan on, well, we can buy heating fuel with that. What's going to happen if that's gone? I've wondered for quite a while with the, uh, the federal government going down the tube as fast as they are, how long are they going to allow Alaska to have $40 billion? When is the state tax going to start? Where yeah. they start, uh, hey, Alaska, uh, the rest of the states here besides North Dakota and maybe Texas, they're broke, and you have an excess of money. Well, it's time to pay the piper. You need to pay your fair share. Mm-hmm. Boom, it's gone. And it's not like people haven't been saying that already. People yeah. have been giving Alaska some uh, crap because we take in more federal dollars than we put out mm-hmm. in taxes. Yep. So, I mean... We, we have had our we've had our teeth firmly planted on the federal teeth for quite some time. I mean, maybe in the next hour or something, we can talk a little bit about Murkowski and how we, hmm. basically we have uh, it venerated. I mean, the, T- Stevens and Murkowski, that team, for years and years and years, it was it wasn't about protecting freedom. It wasn't even about protecting the rights of the unborn. It was about how much money do we get. 
I want to talk about something real quick. You just remind me of something. You want to stay on, Josh? Sure. Yeah, cool. So I've been getting all these. This is totally off subject, but I wanted to bring this up. I've been getting all these uh, emails from different representatives and people that are running for office, right? And they're like, please send us money, please support us, yada yada. So they have these little flyers that I get in the emails or whatever, and uh, they all say, you know, um, create jobs, uh, put Amer- uh, Alaska first. Uh, Getting back on track, moving forward, all these little little jots of coolness where we're supposed to go, yay, he's going to put us back to work. Or, you know, all the little the little tidbits, slogans, yeah, right? the little slogans that they want, that they pass off to us to make us think, well, that's the guy I need to have. And if you look at it, the left and the right both say the exact exactly same the stinking same. thing. And I thought about this the other day. It would be really cool to have a flyer that said, bring back individual liberty. Bring back individual responsibility. Protect your property rights. Blah, blah, blah. Just to go down to have these slogans that were totally nothing but about freedom. And I've yet to ever get one. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry that totally went reverse on what we were talking about. If, but if you, you, you said something to remind me of that. And I well, wanted to talk about that if because you it's did amazing. Get one, I mean, if you, if you think about it, though, all of those issues, all of those issues presuppose that there is something higher than government. Right. And All of those presuppose that there is something higher than government, and, and most people who run for government office are running because they know that once they get in there, they're going to be the the fox running the hen house. You wouldn't get elected anyways. No. I know that for a fact, because uh, when Aaron and I ran for borough a couple times, we had on our little flyers was protect property rights, individual liberty, say no to the Fed, whatever, you know, these little things, and shoot. We couldn't get anyone to vote for us. Well, the yeah. guys that got voted in was, I will steal more, I will give more. I will steal more, I will give more. And it's furthermore, just, my opponents are radicals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're extremists. They're extremists. They say liberty. That's uh, weird. I would just love if somebody out there running for office, please make one flyer and maybe just give it to me and I'll feel happy. <laughs> that says something yeah. else besides educate our kids clean energy affordable energy now yada 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 because you know what all that stuff is bull crap in my mind all that stuff is nonsense bull crap and and they know that too absolutely there's a reason you can say you want to make education better you want green energy you want to clean up you know like poverty and all that stuff but none of these things have ever been fixed there's none of these things that even had progress on them. I mean, yeah. we talked about this Not even. recently. In well, D.C., I, it costs like 25 grand to put a kid through the D.C. public school per year. 25 grand per year. Yep. Which is, uh, you know, as much as some colleges, which isn't that much more valuable in some cases. But um, <laughs> but there's no, there's no, the cause and effect are divorced. Voters don't care about effect. They only care about the pretty dressed up cause with the sparkles on it. You know, they want to hear about change. They want to hear about the things they really like getting better. But they don't actually care about them getting better. And, that, and that's the tried and true thing. And politicians have internalized this to their core, to the point where they've realized that do, actually doing something is probably a negative. If you, could, if you spend your energy actually creating the effect, you're wasting time by talking about the cause. So you should just talk about things you want to do more than actually doing anything. So it's totally reinforced that way. So yeah, the system's it's, built on promises and not on doing anything. Yeah, it's, otherwise you wouldn't have a slogan to go the next time around. Yeah, exactly. If you, yeah, if you, you know, clean up the streets and got rid of crime and cured poverty, what would you campaign on next year? You if know? you got the government out of industry and all of a sudden affordable heat showed up here, wow, what would you run on the next? I mean, everyone in the interior, right? What do they all run on? we got to get affordable energy to Fairbanks. Hasn't happened for 40 years or however no, long it hasn't, it's been, you know, when 50 years. You actually can go over there to the Knowing Library and check. There's a newspaper article that talks about getting a gas pipeline to Fairbanks, natural gas pipeline to Fairbanks. The date is 1959. And you, you know what? Maybe there is no such thing, even in a free market, there would be no such thing as affordable energy in Fairbanks. <laughs> exactly. Then we just need to leave. Or we just need to realize that we're going to spend more if we really like it right. here then, and just bite the bullet and accept it and stop trying to ask somebody else to solve the problem for us. Because yeah. I guarantee you, if we didn't have that little fuel subsidy coming in, we'd find a different way to heat our home than with diesel. Well, also, too, if uh, we didn't have a little government monopoly called GVEA, yeah. and you could have whoever you wanted coming in here and building uh, electrical companies, 
Can you imagine having works? little little neighborhoods, little blocks having their own little mini generators? <laughs> that I mean, it's actually it's doable if you think about it. Josh, thanks for being on the phone with us, and uh, Josh Bennett, thanks for being here in person. We are out of time. Yeah, thanks for calling. And in. Uh, we're going to have another hour coming up next. It's Patriots Lament on the way right after the Fox News here on KFAR. We are a local talk radio 660 on your AM dial. Alrighty then, welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio 660 on your AM dial. Another beautiful Saturday in fair. You know, yeah. One of the things you really love about the weather here in Fairbanks is that if you don't like it, stick around ten minutes. Yeah, and you know what's crazy? It's like it's uh, ten o'clock in the morning here, and it's almost like it's seven thirty. I know. Night. I know. It's weird. The sun is just in a different position than normally at ten. That is weird. The borough building still looks crappy. The bur- <laughs> you know, the borough building has its own internal glow. I it doesn't think. matter what time of day it is. It's just it's like powered on the hearts and flesh of the uh, people in the, the glow borough. of toxic cockroaches <laughs> <laughs> scurrying about. Uh, the oh. golden heart. Yeah. <laughs> the black and gold heart. Black. Hey. That's what I'm. <laughs> All right. Oh, we're in the totally different show. Now. Yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a different show. I just try to uh, no, but but Dave, you're still weaving, and uh, you know, honestly, he's I actually got, gone. That's the weird part. No, no he's not he, even here right now. The, uh, you know, <laughs> we're channeling him. He's been gone for a long time, but you know, I can I can I tell you very honestly, Dave, that my wife listening at home has told me a number of times that she really likes it when you're on the program. Oh, so cool. I, I really hope that you'll continue to call in from wherever it is around the world that you end up. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping to end up a few different places so I can call in from all sorts of places where people speak in scary languages and things like that to give you guys uh, just kind of word from the street. Like those shows from Mexico, I thought those were really fun. Yeah, that was good. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah, I'm going to try and do that, definitely. Yeah, when you get to Chile, give me a call. Uh, you got to beat me there. I will. All right. Well, if you end up going to Singapore or something, I'd like to hear from you then, because that's uh, oh that's yeah, South Korea is potentially on the uh, on the docket. Really? So yeah, that would be cool. But how are you going to live day? What's that? Day to day. <laughs> yeah, I mean the same way everybody always lives. Making that's... good cash money, right? Right. I mean, granted, it'll be Canadian currency, so yeah. So they if use, there is a U.S. dollar they collapse, use it Canadian won't go down currency nearly in as much. Singapore. It was, no. It'll be funny. I mean, some days you'll be making more money. Then Americans, other days, you'll be like, you know, like back and forth. You'll be richer, yeah. then poorer, then richer and poorer, richer yeah. and poorer, and poorer, and poorer, and poorer, poorer, depending on what day it is. <laughs> but the books will still cost more in Canada, don't they? Uh, there's a lot of things that cost more, but I'm going to avoid you know, those costs. Books cost more? I thought everything was free. <laughs> anytime, you, anytime you go and you purchase a book, yeah, you'll see on, on the cover, it'll have the list price of the U.S. and the list price of oh, Canada. Right. It's always, it's always in, more. Uh, I, used to thought, I used to think it was because of the exchange rate, because... The dollar used to be worth more than the Canadian dollar. And now I'm thinking, wait, is that a fallacy? <laughs> is, there, is there any worth to the dollar? Has there ever been any worth to that or any other fiat currency? When I was in Australia a little over a year ago, I was there for three weeks, and the dollar lost, the U.S. dollar lost 8% against the Australian dollar while I was there. So I was noticing that on my foreign transaction fees because I go to the ATM to take out 100 bucks or whatever. And uh, when I got there, it was like after the fee, it was like 102. And when I left after the fee, it was like 111. I was like, oh, yikes. Dang. Yeah. Prices were going up in real time because the U.S. dollar was falling. I actually always, actually, actually, going back to that book thing, I always thought that that was a ploy by the American government to put the Canadian price on there to keep us, this, like, don't move to Canada. Books are $3 more. <laughs> It's another way to keep us here. Because we all read so much, right? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, especially the important importance. They, oh, no, you can get those for free. Oh, mm. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Only uh, only magazines cost more. <laughs> all right. I don't know where you're going with that. I was uh, just uh, referring to the Mises Institute. Any of the good books that you should be reading that we always do. People Magazine. What yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> God. Or Us yeah. Weekly, yeah. All right, me, now go back to your really saying quality. Mises. Uh, a lot of that stuff from Mises you can get online. Yeah, the books that we always talk about and encourage people to read, and we don't know if anyone actually is because no one really calls in and converses with us with anything we actually talk about. We get some posts on the uh, on the blog. Though. That's true. Yeah. But anyway, those books, you can get them almost all of them free. I mean, that's 
I think that's Saints. I really appreciate them for that. They give out free literature where they could be making money because, I mean, especially now, more people are interested in it and they could be like, yeah, mm-hmm. cha-ching. They're like, nope, this is what we want to do, obviously, because they have a loftier, loftier than a couple bucks. I, I think that's pretty sweet. Loftier goal. I, I mean, you, one of the things that you said Liberté. That reason, when we started this program over a year ago, I remember when you were trying to convince me to come in and run the board and make it so that, that we had an opportunity to do this. I, at first, I resisted the idea because I, I didn't need to be up early on a Saturday morning, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and, that was the major battle with everyone in here except for me. Oh, man. Like, and then that other hour, that totally different show. Totally, yeah, when that one came, I was like, Phew. Nine o'clock in the morning. Nine o'clock on a o'clock on Saturday? No. Uh, I tried but, really hard to make it later. At least we pushed Glenn back for Glenn back forward an hour. That's yeah. the only yeah, that that's was what the made part. it worthwhile, right there. Like, <laughs> two less hours of Glenn back, but ching. <laughs> okay, okay, we are we are drifting way off into like just total oblivion here. The, the the point of what we were trying to say is that when we started this program, it was to get people thinking about liberty, yeah. and, and and to get people to stop looking at themselves as the property of somebody else. <laughs> amazing, amazing how challenging that is. Oh, it is amazing. I, mean, I know it's it's pathetic. We have become. I am really. We are. Uh, you've mentioned before, Josh, several different times that we're the best armed slaves in history. That you know, we we say, well, as long as we have our gun rights, you know, so we have the Second Amendment. And you see the NRA and all these other people that that will champion the Second Amendment, while we have virtu- where we have basically gotten rid of freedom of speech. You don't need a warrant anymore. You can indefinitely detain people. Uh, you can't. No, I can't. The government. The government. The, <laughs> the, 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 the cost. The, who are they in costumes? What do you call them? The criminals in costumes. Criminals in costumes. They're the ones. They, they can just pick anybody up off the street and detain them indefinitely without a reason, without a warrant, without a, a court date, uh, without any kind of sense of justice at all, simply by saying, well, we think they might be a threat. And they're just doing their job. <clears throat> That's all they're doing. I mean, if you ask them, they'll tell you that we're just doing our job. I mean, those guys back in 45 said the same thing. It didn't work out too good for them, but apparently we've forgotten that, and it's a good, it's okay now. Referring to Nuremberg, if no one, anyone. Right. Anyways, but going back to a year, or go ahead. The reason we invited Steve is for guilt by association. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, somebody's got to go down. (laughs) And apparently you have to have four. (laughs) Oh, right. I have a good shirt. You'll be our Michael Anderson. (laughs) What's up, Mike? <laughs> wow. Okay, I am much more attractive than Mike. I, I, all love, all love to you, brother, if you're listening, Mike. But uh, seriously, and why, why, Dave? Do you think it is so hard? Uh, I, I don't know. If I knew the answer to that, boy, I could, I could die happy at that point. Is it because it? Is it because people? Um, you said it's really hard to get. What was it? What was the question? It's about? hard to get people to not want to be property of somebody else to is convince that, them that they're not is that because everybody wants to view everybody else's property as theirs oh man that's wow. uh yeah that's a possibility is it, i mean you kind of see the same mentality with our government in general i mean everybody wants to lend legitimacy to things that people are doing to oppress them through government because they themselves could be that same government yeah they see the potential for that and they realize that if they are going to ask for their own freedom, then it would only be fair to uh, allow their neighbor the same thing. So right, basically, so in order to become the slave owner, you must first ag- accept being the slave. No, I'm saying um, the ideology of being told from birth that you too could be the president someday um, just lends you to start believing that any any political office is legitimate in and of the fact that you could be in that same political office. That's, I mean, it's, so the whole concept of why is it so hard to get somebody to want to be free? Why is it so hard to free someone from themselves? Because they see their bondage as legitimate. I saw. I uh, talked to a guy just. Oh, go ahead. No, go for it. I just uh, talked to a guy today. I um, announced I was moving on from uh, politics. That was that was a couple weeks ago. Oh yeah, back in the day, somewhere back in history. <laughs> I it's announced that I was uh, out of out of this thing, right? Okay, I had fun. I did what I um, felt like I accomplished as much as I wanted to in that realm, so I was done. I'm happy. And had some phone calls and emails, and this one guy that I met recently who's super outstanding guy, real solid. And he said, well, what, what are we going to do? I mean, and we went back and forth over, well, what do we do if we don't do anything? And so we went back into the political part of it, well, 
is the political side what we were really wanting for change? And we agreed, no. Obviously, we both agree that political change isn't real change. It's just whoever, which I said to him, is we're arguing over who's going to point the gun at us. So why are we doing that? We want our guy to point the gun at us? I don't want anyone to point a gun at me. So basically, I was saying that I'm done you now because I joined the Republican Party and did the thing for Ron Paul down in uh, Anchorage a couple months ago. And that was fun. But I'm done. I'm back to whatever. And I didn't actually ever leave that. But now people are saying, well, what are we going to do now? And and I feel a little bit bad because I understand. I mean, that, that – um, is in us because it's been driven into us for so long that, well, this is the only way to make change is to get our political guy in there. And no, we've got to get to the point where we can finally say we withdraw consent. When 200 years later, you see that it doesn't work anyway. I mean, I've been saying a lot lately the impossibility of limited government. And I truly believe with all my heart that there can be no such thing as uh, limited government. And for anyone to argue that isn't opening their eyes to 200 years of limited government. <laughs> but, but, you know, back to the point uh, you made a little earlier about people thinking that they can get into office. Whenever you talk about, you know, what are we going to do? People are always like, oh, well, you should run for something or you need to go out and vote. And um, that's exactly where their mind goes. And if you suggest anything else, if you suggest leaving or uh, not voting and telling people why you're not voting... You know, if you suggest a real vote of no confidence in the system, uh, people flip out. It's like, wow, you're you're proposing something that's outside of the, you know, tiny sphere of so-called influence we're supposed to have that's never worked ever. How dare you? Right. Well, it, it, but why doesn't it work? I mean, it, I'm believing more and more Rothbard's uh, approach that to think that you could have a limited government when you're uh, giving people unilaterally the power not only to tax you but to legislate law – there's no other outcome from that except for corruption. Right. We're talking about you possibly think in your mind that there's going to be any other any other outcome. Where we we talk about the the only um, reason for a limited government 200 years ago, this was their thought, given from Locke and those guys, was to protect property. Government is instituted to protect property. This is the end of government. Blah blah blah. But then we have to come to the point where where does government get its funding from stealing from the same property they're supposed to protect? So automatically, they're the thieves stealing from the property they're supposed to be there to protect. And and yet even then, our our founders had that fatal flaw of slavery built into their system where they did not want to come right out and protect property because then they would be basically enshrining slavery forever in the country. Well, they did they did a pretty good job of protecting property in the beginning just based on the fact that if you didn't own property you weren't allowed to vote or to hold a public office and that right there if you just use common sense would say that nobody's going to go into office and vote themselves taxes nobody's going to vote themselves theft of their own property so for a long time the tax burden on american people was very light and you don't see the rampant um, tax gathering of 40% that you see today until they change that Everybody, we became a true democracy where everybody could run and everybody could vote. And the have-nots got to vote against the haves. Right, and I have no problem against women, but the more we added, the worse it got. I mean, once and then women could vote, and then you had it. It has nothing to do with women. It's just more numbers. Everyone. Well, yeah, I mean, not even. And then the property, they lowered the voting be, age to be 18. absolutely, you know, totally clear. Landowners could vote, and the only way that you could tax was by taxing land. You could tax merchants also, uh, but you know they they came and went. I think the merchant tax was stupid because it taxes the consumer. But the only way you could raise revenue domestically, so called, was by taxing land, and the only people who could vote were land owners, right? Yeah. So well, if you think if about you it, every, every into, time, uh, and the, the only way you could be in government too was to be land owner. Right. You, so you couldn't hold a public, if you're in the, public office. yeah, if you're in public office and you know that by voting for a tax, by implementing a tax, it's to steal your property, you're going to go, N- yeah, you yeah I'm not going to do you that. You couldn't do anything against anyone who didn't own property, yeah. basically. As a as a person in government, you they were you couldn't touch them. You could only affect the other people who were voting at the time. Whereas now, I mean, now that everybody can vote, um, it's all against all. And, you know, and it wasn't great before. It was still, you know, a system of voting to see who's going to steal from what. Yeah. 
Um, and New England largely controlled that right from the get-go. But, you know, it, you're voting literally to tax yourself. It wasn't some abstract thing. All right. And based on the same line going down the line of uh, limited government, since we seem to have went down that course, so the other problem with limited government is the way our system, in my opinion, works where we vote people in for a limited amount of time. Right, so they have a very limited amount of time to deal. When you're only in office for four years, right? And so I think it's funny. Here's a good concept for you. So right now I can't uh, at my tactical store. I can't get in a single lower receiver. I can't get any AK-47. I can't get anything. I Sam is 762 by 39. I had uh, 150,000 rounds come in the, uh, about two months ago. Now I couldn't buy one bullet to save my life. And the reason is because Obama's about to get elected again, tentatively, right? So everybody's like, oh, this time he's going to do it for sure, you know? Everybody's freaking out. we got to run on guns. we got to run on ammo. And the same class people, the right, uh, the right is the same people that calls for term limits, right? Mm-hmm. And they can't even see the insanity there. So this is Obama's last term, so he's going to go crazy. He has nothing restricting him anymore. But let's have term limits in amplify the problem for every single person that ever runs. That way okay, they know now, now they have a term go. limit so they can be absolutely as destructive as possible. Knowing that there's no repercussions because they can't run again anyway. Right. So h- how can anybody sit there in one breath say that we're screwed because Obama's only got one term left and talk about how we need term limits? And yet without the term limits, don't, aren't we... I mean, and I'm, I'm not playing devil's advocate. I'm honestly... I, this is, It's been so deeply ingrained into my mind here. Uh, wouldn't we end up basically having a ruling class when it would be impossible for anyone else to enter into the field? What do you think we have now? Yeah. We do have a ruling ca- class. It's just that, called politicians. No, that, that's exactly right. We have a ruling class now, anyway you look at it, but this ruling class doesn't have anything, any reason to be restrained, any reason to be restricted. It, the, it, the limited government ideology is actually twice as destructive as, say, a monarch would be, because a monarch can sit back and say, hey, i got to hand this down to my kids, and he's going to hand it down to his kids, whereas you have a guy in there for four years who has the same powers, actually has more powers, because a king can't, never was able to create law, only to work within the bounds of what was already established as law, whereas our legislative people can create numerous paper laws, as we see, since every single aspect of our life is regulated. They can create anything they want. They have a very limited amount of time to do it, and no, nothing on the other side to well, it, hold them back. And it's gotten to the point now, too, in terms of the creation of the laws, that you literally cannot know what the law is. You can go out hunting. Look at the regs, make your plans, go out there and take a trip, and have the regs change while you're hunting so that you end up breaking the law simply by going to get a caribou. It's funny because there's like, how many laws are added every year, Aaron, statutorily? Oh, 250,000. I okay. missed a couple shows, so I forgot. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, I did say it every week for a little bit. Uh, yeah. It, hundreds of thousands get added into the Federal Register every year. And people still go around saying, well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And they say that whenever somebody else is going to jail. Yeah. They don't say that when they're going to jail. Well, and, and, and yet we have the very people who voted for them admitting they had they didn't read yeah. what well, they were voting right, for. Again, as, as Aaron points out, in a democracy, a limited government like we have, what's the repercussion? What if you pass a law that, uh, you know, that's horrendous? What, what's the uh, consequence? What's the consequence for anything anyone does in office? Zip. I don't think there is one. Zip. Right, our, None. Our they limit- might get voted out in four years. Big whoop. And if they don't, that's my point. So let's let's put a restriction on that. And it exemplifies or amplifies probably, or sorry, the problem. Right. Maybe, well, it, it, our government automatically by default introduces the worst type of government. Well, it also amplifies it because of the fact that they allow us to vote every so many years, right? If you get to vote for someone in two years or four years, you're going to go along with it. Because how many times, how many people do you know, I've been told this hundreds of times, over and over, well, next time, we'll get our guy in there. It's going on right now. I mean, people are running for office, and we're going to get our representatives in there this time. So... You perpetuate this thing because you think, eh, it's good enough. Even though these jackasses are in office, I'm going to get my jackass in there next time. Just watch. Which answers Dave's question from be, from before. Yeah. So you Why never, so you never, 
this is the greatest thing. They, we've decided to ourselves it's the greatest thing because in so many years we can get our guy in. And it never happens. And no matter who gets in, it gets worse. But we yeah. keep saying, next time. Even if it does happen, uh, and this is to, <laughs> yeah. to Aaron's point, it makes the assumption that the guy is mm-hmm. the problem mm-hmm. and not the system right. itself. So what Aaron's pointing out is like when a guy gets elected, and if he if he knows he's not going to get reelected, if he's a lame duck or whatever, um, it takes an extraordinary individual not to just start you know waving their sword about and passing laws and and doing backdoor deals and stuff like that because they have this power. It's in their hand, but only for a limited amount of time. And you'd be hard pressed to find a politician who didn't change fundamentally after they got elected. Like there's all these good guys who got elected. And then, uh, you know, everybody, oh, he lied to us. Duh. <laughs> right? <laughs> Check, you know, on that goes. same note, I mean, um, the way that we blame blame the guy rather than the system. Here's a good example of that. Guys come into my store every day, and I talk about, oh, I can't get anything. I'm so sorry because Obama might get elected again. They're like, oh, yeah, he's, you know, he's planning to do this and that and this and that. And I say the same thing to every one of them. I said, well, wait a minute. I thought that Congress passes laws. <laughs> and every time they're just, uh... Uh, uh, and predominantly it's a Republican Congress. They're in House, right? It has been, yeah. House and Senate. So if the president doesn't create laws and we end up with gun control, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Who's going to get blamed? The president. That's right. Who got blamed for the health care? The president. Who passed the health care into law? The Republican Congress, House and yeah. Senate. Oh, yeah. And look at the yeah, look. <laughs> NDAA, mean? right? That was made by Republicans. <laughs> yeah. And who do they go? It's the friggin' president. By golly, yeah, we got it. Was, get it was the Republican presidential candidate who had writ, written that bill. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> right, so you have guys like Sean Hannity just Sean? spewing nonstop how we got to get rid of Obama. Yeah, the, you know, the, the Get Rid of Obama Express, I think they call it. Mm. And they blame an Obama for everything you can possibly think of, and Congress creates law. And and did just a couple of years before that, they were blaming Bush for everything. And if people don't understand, because unfortunately, I think this is necessary to say, we would like to get rid of Obama. What? We're not. We don't want him to be reelected, but we would like for no one to be reelected. No one to I, be elected. Period. I cannot down Im- with the presidency. I, amen to that. I cannot imagine for a moment what kind of a president Mitt Romney would be that would make me like him more than Obama. <laughs> I cannot imagine what kind of a president Mitt Romney would be that oh. would make him anything less no, so than this, a tyrant. This is funny. So um, a few months ago, we actually talked about this on the show, maybe six months ago. Uh, they asked, like CNN or somebody asked all the Republican presidential candidates back when there were like eight of them. They're like, so, uh, you know, should the president have the power? It was, I think it was when the NDAA was going through. They said, should the president have the power to detain anyone he wants without a warrant, blah, blah, blah. And every single one of them, uh, Bachman, Santorum, uh, Rick Perry, Gingrich, uh, Romney, Romney, all of them said in, in a whole bunch of words, like three paragraphs, yeah. Because I might get elected. That's what all of them said, except for one guy. Ron Paul said no. Like he didn't need a paragraph. He just said no. Simple word. No. And everybody else is like, well, you know, as long as it's not abused. But you know, it is the president's job, and we wouldn't want to take any power away from the office of the presidency. Which, how funny is that? That phrase right there. As long as it's not abused. How how can you not abuse throwing someone in prison without due process? That's abuse by itself, isn't it? I but it, guess not. What's the point you're trying to make, though, is that they, even those people right there in that moment, were lending legitimacy to it because they might be the president. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's well, exactly it. We'll be back on the other side of the Fox News. All right, welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We are online at KFAR660.com. And you can also reach us on the email. The address is PatriotsLament at gmail.com. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the website is PatriotsLament.blogspot.com as well. All right, gentlemen, here's what we're, we're looking at. We were just talking about this issue of what shall we do. I mean, that's kind of how we started the, the hour. Uh, people talking to you, Josh, and asking you, well, what shall we do? You know, you're, uh, you're talking about having that 
when they, they reconvened down there in Anchorage for that second half of the convention and you didn't go and people were like, well, what about the people you were supposed to represent? Uh, and basically, what, what did you quit? What's what's going on with that? Well, no, I, I did make... I did make my voice heard for the people I represent. I represent myself. I don't wish to represent anyone. I mean, that's you other people's can't. problem. Yeah, that's, but by, but that's by actually impossible. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, now this is this goes right back to the heart of the matter of why I took exception to you joining up with the, the Ron Publicans in the first place. Mm-hmm. By participating in the process and having people vote for you to go down to Anchorage and represent them. That didn't actually happen in my case, so I'm totally clear. Wait, how did you get chosen to go down to Anchorage? It was just a volunteer thing because uh, we weren't didn't enough. have enough people. weren't enough people to fill it. That's how it we, we had 11 oh, seats, wow. and there was only nine of us. Yeah. So I was like, cool, didn't get voted in. Okay. I said, hey, I want to go. So. All right, well, that, that kind of shoots my argument apart <laughs> a little bit. Bang! But, um, but, but you did participate in the process, and you did oh, yeah. lend legitimacy to the whole issue of there are... You know, how do we have a choice if we are limited to just two choices? No, I'd say I was, uh, I was anti-process. Yeah, that's what I heard. I, I heard you were pretty anti-process. I wasn't really part of... You process. weren't supporting the chosen Republicans? No, it was a lot of fun not doing that, actually. I mean, I, yeah, whatever. I, I went down because I wanted to uh, spread the message. We got to meet a lot of people, I've said this before, and we got to talk about the message. Interesting, because you saying now that you're done has a bigger impact because people saw you there, too. I yeah. mean, you, you uh, it's like... Uh, well, I think walking on the razor's edge without being cut, right? <laughs> it's like, mm, I'm just going to try this for a little bit, and I'm out. And the people who are really married to it are a lot more affected by that than had they not known you at all. Yeah, and it'd be more fun. Uh, I've had some good conversations with those people now that it never, like you just said, would have never happened. Would have never happened before. So I figured mission accomplished for me anyway. I mean, I wasn't trying to save anything. I sure the heck wasn't going. I mean, we've talked about this with some guys here a couple of weeks ago. Was I was never trying to save the Republican Party. Heck no. They can go down for all I care. So mission accomplished for me. I had a good time, and that's good enough. But how do you answer people who come up to you and say, well, what shall we do? I don't, isn't that part of the biggest problem that we have right now Withdraw in our society? Withdraw consent from the political party because it's what we've been trying to say for a year. Why do we want to figure out which person points the gun at us? Why do we want to say, well, my guy's pointing the gun now? I don't understand. It's been a, When we did this a year ago, it's been a little over a year now, about a year and a month or yeah, two or three or Something like that. Five. But so I really thought, I didn't think that I was going to be some great orator or, you know, we were all going to combine our minds and boom, all of a sudden people were going to be running down here in droves confessing their sins to statism. But I did think that maybe some people would, like, wake up a little bit and they're like, yeah, yeah, okay. But man... I don't know. I mean, I seriously contemplated not doing another year, for real, because I thought, what a waste of time. I really felt like that. I have felt like that over and over. Like, why am I wasting my time? Even though I enjoy this. I enjoy coming in with these guys. But it's like, why is it so freaking hard for people not to want somebody to rule over them? I do not understand it, because that makes zero. I mean, that is not anywhere in my mind and hasn't been since I was really young. To have someone rule over me has not ever been part of my conscience. And I thought that was pretty simple to point out to people, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, shoot. Yeah, I just never heard that before. <laughs> no, they call in and go, well. <laughs> as long as we get the right person. That sounds like a good idea, but. But, yeah, Randy Butt calls in and says, <laughs> but, but, and he agrees it's theft. He agrees it's murder. He agrees, he agrees. But I think we need it. <laughs> so that, yeah, Jimmy um, Christmas. Go yeah, ahead. Doug, what shall we do, Dave? Well, Doug Casey says uh, he's reached the conclusion after years of doing this, you know, 40-plus years, that uh, certain people are just born differently. Some people are born without the ability to contemplate what um, taking control of their own life would be like. And I think that that's what we're experiencing, is we thought that a lot of people out there who claim to be adults – we're going to be responsible or want to be responsible for their own uh, lot in life and embrace that responsibility and the freedom it entails. And I think what we found out is that isn't the case. There are a few people out there, and we've definitely reached a few people like that who are thinking that way and they just hadn't put the last piece of the puzzle in. Yeah. Maybe a piece that they were born with that had been buried. 
Um, but most people are not that way. Most people don't believe that they're actually adults. They believe that they're children uh-huh. and there's uh-huh. some sort of state dad, yeah. um, which is just other people. Not not to break anybody's bubble, but it's not Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or something. So it's by just somebody being else. elected, you aren't immediately infused with this extra knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> that You know, it, this actually is reminding me of something that Natalie Howard has mentioned a number of times. For those who don't know her, she's uh, one of the borough assembly members in the, for the Fairbanks North Star Borough. Or she might have been. She uh, might have been. It depends. <laughs> At some point in the space-time continuum, she was... Uh, and me and the future. Anyway, the point is that she has said again and again what it comes down to is rules for recess. Yeah, yeah, that's that, what she that talks we, about. We are inculcated yeah. in the public school system with this idea from the moment we go to the first day of kindergarten, the playground belongs to whom? It doesn't belong to us. It's not our playground. It's public property, it, which is what a what a what a load that is. But it, this is some kind of this common property that belongs to all of us, or they just come right out and say it belongs you know, to the teachers. It it's would the be teachers. Well, that no, I mean I don't know if they do that. If they said it was the teachers' property, and the teachers could demonstrate they had title to it or something like that, mm-hmm. then that's fine, right? I mean mm-hmm. uh, that would be okay, but I don't think they do yeah, that. It, and either way, the kids that that's never explicitly laid right, out. Right, exactly. It's like, the reason you can't jump off the top of the slide. Is because, is because I told you so. It's because I told you so. Not this is my property, and I'm not going to have you getting injured here. It's because I told you so. And you know, we, we treat children uh, to a much older age than I think they should be. We treat them like like children instead of like <laughs> rational adults. And so, what do you end up with when they grow up? You end up with adult children instead of rational thinking people. Molyneux talks about this a lot. Yeah. He says if you don't try and if you never try and reason with your kids until they're quote unquote old enough to understand reason if you yell at them or give them stupid answers or hit them what are they going to what are they going to respond to if you don't establish yeah. that the way that we're going to settle things the way that the adult figure in the room here is going to settle things is with respect and rationality or at least give you the option for that what are you going to end up with when when kids grow up you know uh, and all the rules in school it's they're always because why can't mm-hmm. i do that because that's uh, the rule i'm and, a teacher because I'm the teacher, and I'm and indoctrinating you to be this way for the rest of your life. And, and you can't, you, and no matter how <laughs> and much the par- you want well, the parents to, you kick the can too. You yeah. know, the parents are the ones who are like, "Well, you have to respect your teacher because they're your teacher." You and have the kid to respect goes, the presidency, regardless yeah, oh, of the same, man in office. It's the same thing. Same thing. It's the same All thing. of our rules for recess that we get when we're little kids in the public school system, we apply them to the political system when we quote. We don't grow treat up. people like adults. We don't behave like adults. No. If we're adults. And we own ourselves and we have all this responsibility and this liability and stuff like that. Why do we give certain people a pass, right? Well, how come, uh, you know, how come politicians don't have to behave like adults? Yeah, and how many times, how many, how long we've gone here where we've tried to convince people that politicians don't deserve respect just because of their office? How hard has that been to convince people? Yeah. It's been nearly impossible. Yeah. I tell people that all the time. They go, "Well, he is. I mean, he is, uh, he was a uh, well. He's in the office. I mean, automatically. Well, I, re- I, I may not respect the man, but I respect the office." We can't even get people to concede that just because yeah. a person sitting in a seat above them does not demand so, respect. Born respect. differently, they were born to stay on the farm, and and that's fine. You know, to those people, you're, you're talking about. You know, what shall we do? Um, We'll roll this into something more interesting. But for those people out there, what should they do? Well, if they're listening to this show consistently, they they think there's a problem or they're they're aware there's a problem. What should they do? Well, you know what? They should invest as heavily as possible in things that they know will be taxed that are within the jurisdiction of the United States government. Step one. Um, step two, if they have a passport, they should throw it in the shredder and never leave. Right? Um, boy, step three, you know, buy U.S. bonds. Right? Go out and buy some American bonds and really put your weight behind the country. You know, step four, don't question anything that's going on. Try and consolidate as much power as possible. And step five and six would be vote as hard as you can. Just vote all the time. And, you know, step six, run for office. You if, even practice, if, practice voting. Practice voting, yeah. Make up ballots and, like, you know, write down, you know, criminal A, criminal B. Think really hard about it. It's like, well, this guy sucks. This guy sucks too, but in a different way. And then make sure you pick one. Which one sucks less? Right. And definitely yell at people who don't want to pick a criminal. 
those are the thing. The people who were born slaves who really just want to stay on the farm and be slaughtered eventually, those are the six steps they should take. There's one stay completely invested where you know you're going to be taxed to death. Um, shred your passport. You know, vote as hard as possible. Definitely do all those things. Because well, it's, it's been working great. Because it's, it's been working great. And you, if you, you think there's problems, step, if you think there's problems ahead, you definitely want to be in that position. <laughs> you, you missed a step. One of the things they also need to do is they need to turn off the radio and stop listening to this because we might oh, yeah. end up saying a dangerous idea oh, yeah. that might actually somehow catch something in their brain deep down inside and make them question oh. whether any of this is. True. I did just those six points. Those are the CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox News line, though. So I, I was actually going to break right then and say, we'll be back on the Sean Hannity yeah, show, right? That was Is pretty he's... standard Sean Hannity yeah, stuff. That was. So, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely do all those things. Do not do any of the other stuff I've suggested in other shows that people get scared about. Don't look overseas. Definitely don't have a passport that's ready to rock. Definitely don't have enough money saved that you could actually leave or do something else. Um, definitely don't get to know your neighbors. Definitely don't get to know your neighbor. No. Definitely don't stop spending your time in the political system and instead spending it with your family and friends and spending it figuring out how to get out or to move assets around. Keep on not reading. Keep on encourage that. Keep on not reading. Well, yeah, there's a whole read. bunch of options for that. I mean, there's what American Idol. There's oh yeah, um, there's a plethora. The Voice. Yeah. There's uh, Fox News. You I can mean, go with monthly. Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, it's you know great, the people who are are really into the political system. It's amazing because um, we've had this this discussion group, the Austrian Scholars Group, uh, which you can look up if you go to meetup.com and you look up uh, uh, Campaign for Liberty Fairbanks, you'll find that group. That group's been going for two and a half years, and we've been reading books about politics and philosophy and stuff, but we've also been reading books on investing and diversification and internationalization for two and a half years. And it's amazing because there are people I know who are very, very politically involved, who have spent thousands of hours on political campaigns since then. They have not read a single book that we've read in that group. And whenever they're faced with uh, me talking to them about, well, have you done this yet? Have you done this yet? Do you have any gold or silver? You know, whatever. Have you even looked into it? They say, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Wait, wait, they but they flushed time? thousands of hours, thousands of dollars down the Joe Miller toilet. They flushed thousands of hours down the Alaska Republican Party toilet. Oh. And what do they have to show for it? Yep. You know, you, you're going to make my head explode, Dave, because I mean that that whole Joe Miller Murkowski thing illustrates, I think, everything that's wrong with the political process. First and foremost, how did she get into office? The fact well, there was a political process. Her, da- yeah. her daddy gave it to her. Basically, the king is saying, "I want my child to inherit my kingdom." He appointed her into the position, and immediately the Republican apparatchiks jumped in line behind her and said, well, she's a good Republican, when in fact, she had never voted consistently along the party platform ever. Doesn't even matter. Doesn't matter. There are people who spent time being concerned about that at all, both ways, right? There are Republicans who are like, oh, good for him, good for Frank, and then there were Democrats like, oh, my God, and then there were people who said, meh, and they went on making money, stuffing dollars away. Saving in gold and silver, buying foreign property, and of those three parties, of the people who are like, ah, we got our girl, and the people are like, oh, this is a travesty, and the people who made money and, and stuffed it away, guess who guess who made themselves better off? <laughs> well, but it gets better. It's not the first two. It gets two. better because then the rest of the people are like, well, we need to get her out. And that's how do you do it through the political process? You get her out in the primary, right? The best more So time. She, was in, she was voted out during the primary price of the process, and she is like, No. I don't want to leave. Which is fine. And so basically, I got a bunch of her other friends to come and v- write her back in. Well, I, I don't see any problem with that at all. That's no, that's totally fine, baby. I mean, actually, the write-in thing, I mean, that's more legitimate than anything. And yeah. it's hilarious because Alaskans are like, oh, Alaska will be fine. You know, I definitely want to stay in Alaska forever. But, you know, I haven't shredded my passport or thrown my, uh, my money away. So I still have the option of leaving. But I'm going to stay here forever. And... Um, what do they do? They vote Lisa Murkowski in to give them more socialism. So so good on them. They really showed what Alaska is about. And it was, you know, it was fairly honest. A whole bunch of people right now. It really in. was, yeah. More honest than you know, you always talk about the two choices. Well they said they said screw the two choices, we're taking this third one. We're gonna take the most socialistic person running who's gonna get the biggest amount of largesse channeled back to us. So go independent Alaskans. Look how free and independent you are. Good on you. Yeah, it was a perfect, uh, so, perfect. So we, we kind of, uh, this has been like the sarcastic second half of the hour. Uh, so talking about Josh not participating, 
we've talked about non-participation as a huge, huge amount of power. Like you have this huge amount of power as an individual to not give consent to things you don't approve of. And everybody thinks that that means we're powerless. So you have like one of the most uh, conniving, powerful dudes in the state political system, Randy Rudrick. Okay. And he is no longer the chair of the Republican Party. Uh, Russ Millett is. He got ousted. So what did he tell all the Republicans, the good old school Republicans, to do concerning the um, the reconvening of the state convention? Back on the back on the ninth. Back on the ninth. What did he tell them to do regarding participation in the Republican Party he at that event? He told them to go someplace else. He told them to go fishing. Elsewhere. He told them to withdraw consent and not be there. Why would he do that? What was his stated reason for doing that? He knows the power of non-consent. He said, yeah, he said, if there's not this many people here, they can't have a quorum and they can't pass anything that's binding. When you withdraw consent to a massive degree, you undermine the legitimacy of whatever is being foisted upon you. And of course, the state is is going to be able, they don't care about a quorum, you know, with the borough elections, you get you get 30 percent of 10 percent of the population. They say, well, the people chose me. No, they didn't. But they have far less legitimacy as a result of that. If you point that out to them, if you say, well, you know, only only three in a hundred voting age people voted for you, uh, they hate that because they know that they don't have any legitimacy. They don't have anybody's approval. So if Randy Ruderick is saying the same thing we are when he's all pouty about losing power, what does that probably mean? He knows power better than I do. He's made his whole life around it. Power comes from withdrawing consent. Yeah, we... And, and and yet, look at the, the, the way that people look down their nose at you. and What? You don't vote? Yeah, yeah well, it's funny because it's oh. the same Republicans who didn't go to the convention who look down at you <laughs> for not voting. It's That's like, you know right. what? You guys look in the mirror. Figure something out. <laughs> it's funny, too, because so many people, like, even the, when they call in, they'll say, well, if we don't, then the commies are going to end up running the place, and blah, which they are anyways. But if so many of us, if so many more people would just take that little leap, it's... it's uh, I always kind of thought it was just a little step, like, yeah, that's not that big a deal. But apparently it is. It's like this gigantuan leap. We figured that out. If people would actually do that, the people would say, what do we do? What do we do? There's so many people like in the interior right now who were the Paul bots that are really upset right now. Like, oh, oh, we almost had it. We almost had it. If they would, if all of them would just withdraw consent, let's just see what would happen. Because I mean, we don't know. I mean, no one can say, well, if we did that, then the commies surely will overrun us. Maybe they wouldn't. And Who as knows what really would happen? As individuals, we don't have to wait for everybody else to withdraw consent. True. We can do it one at a time. And, uh, I mean, that's the other thing that people are afraid of. What if everybody else doesn't do what I'm doing? So? Yeah, that's uh, individualism. It's so funny. People are so caught up in being, I'm an individualist. I mean, especially in Fairbanks, Alaska. We're individuals. We're free. We're liberty-minded. We're all about if other people do it. <laughs> yeah. As long as somebody else is doing it, I'm an individual. Yeah. What was uh, Twain? I can't exactly quote him when he said the Patriot is someone that... Uh, the Patriot's someone that does something while he's scorned or whatever. In, in, oh, yeah, in his own... That, that wasn't Twain. It was... Uh, I don't think it was Twain. Yeah. Oh, it was? Okay. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's scorned in his own time. Right. But... Uh, you Once know, everyone... Until everyone go, is doing the same thing, but then you're not a Patriot. Right. Because... Ah, shoot. I need to find it now, but whatever. I hammered that. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> yeah, you mean, Anyways, you basically, mean the, the true Patriot was the one that... Uh, in his mind, was the one that did it anyways. No one else was doing it, and he was scorned and yada, yada, yada. And then once it becomes legitimate to the public side, then everyone kind of goes along with it. And, yeah, great, then it's great, easy to be a patriot. Here's a then. great example yeah. from not-so-recent history is Martin Luther King, Jr. When he, Never met him. No, but when he's... You read about him, though, right? You've uh, seen, I didn't go to public school. You, okay, have I don't you, even know who he is. Have you seen... <laughs> you can <laughs> YouTube. I mean, look at the... the Wait a minute. The, Martin Luther... Martin Luther King Jr. Oh, King Jr. Okay. All right. Well, I read not, about Martin Luther. No, no, I'm not talking about Martin Luther. I'm talking about the fellow of color who basically said, we are not going to participate in your system anymore and led all of these boycotts of the buses and the marches and was mocked and ridiculed and scorned by the public society until he affected change. And now virtually everybody on all the political spectrum look back on Martin Luther King Jr. and claim him as their own. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah, they do do quite well at that, don't they? Yeah. Everybody, well, yeah, everybody's saying, you know, we need to do something. Uh, who goes first? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> All the hands stay down. He was he was one of the people who raised his hands and said, I'm going first. And I don't need I don't need your approval. You don't need to get my back. I'm going to do this anyway. Well, and if you look at that whole movement, it really started, and, and people recognize that it started with Rosa Parks mm-hmm. refusing Again. to give up her seat. Yep. And not waiting for it to be okay. No. Just just saying no. I'm, I'm not, not going to, to comply with your stupid ass law. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, here we go. Did I say it. that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> you are on the air, Steve. Uh, sorry. Right. Though not really. Yeah, it depends. That's weird. It's kind of like magic. This is a really weird day. It's kind of like politics. It's magical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I right. found this quote here. Now I'm... Oh, yeah, this is one of my favorite. One of my favorite Mark Twain quotes is, uh, Suppose you were an idiot, and suppose you're a member of Congress. But then I repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if he were around today, man, he'd have a lot more to write about. <laughs> he would have... He's probably glad he's dead. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, though. I think that sometimes we, we, we magnify our modern issues and make it seem as if we are in somehow a, a worse shape than we really are. Because if you think about it, you're going all the way back to that issue of what shall we do that we started the hour with. That whole issue of we need someone to rule over us. Does anyone here familiar with the ancient literature of the Bible? Oh, yeah, yeah, the right. People the people of stories Israel. all this time. Mm-hmm. The people of Israel. I mean, they we're going back thousands of years, and they, they came out of slavery. They were actually literally slaves. They were set free through a remarkable chain of events that could not be duplicated in history, no matter how hard you tried. And all of a sudden, this huge group of people, a couple million of them, mm-hmm. out in the desert, free, and what do they say? <laughs> We need a ruler. Yeah. What shall we do? <laughs> Who's going to rule over us? Let's go back. I need a king. Somebody Maybe. should have suggested voting. I think it would have worked. It might have. <laughs> well, if the right guy got a <laughs> Only if the right guy got a So lead. here's what, here's this uh, twin quote. In the beginning of a change, the Patriot's a scarce man, brave, but hated and scorned. When his cause succeeds, however, the timid join him, for then it costs nothing to be Patriot. I really think that sums up this whole thing that we've been talking about for a year. The the change, the beginning of change, you're a scarce man because it's scary. So you're hated and scorned. And how many people do you know? I mean, the whole look down your nose and all this and that, that's hatred and scorn. Of like, oh, you, ah. But this is the change. This is what we should do. This is actual real change. I mean, you want to talk about change, get rid of the system. Yeah. That would be change. But so, what would we do, Josh? You know, <laughs> What's it going to look like? <laughs> that would be cheap. It's funny because a lot of the uh, the people who are who don't like what we're talking about, um, they don't actually say that they disagree. Some some people do, you know, no mistake. But a lot of them who don't like what we're saying don't disagree. They are not in disagreement with us, but they still don't like what we're saying. Because of that, because of the cost associated with it, you're going to have to do something, and it's going to be very different, and you're not going to have consensus, and uh, it keeps people frozen for now. Wow, that's sad. Oh, I didn't think about that. A lot of people they don't disagree with us. A lot of people uh, don't disagree, but they still hate us for it. Well, and no, 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 and now again, that, going. That's how it comes out. I think it's insecurity yeah. and fear, and that's mm-hmm. the only way they know how to express it. Oh, don't talk about that. I don't need to hear about that. I don't want to hear about that. You're wrong. They stick their fingers and, in their ears. And, and they're not Aww. saying, you know, they're not saying you're wrong because of these reasons. You know, here's here's where you made a mistake in your reasoning. You know, you're not looking at history right. Uh, you're not looking at, you know, inflation numbers correctly or whatever. They're not actually, like, dismantling the argument. There are a few people out there who, who attack the argument. Um, we've had some good calls on that. But yeah. most of the people out there who disagree, they don't disagree in that way. They go, no, don't say that. I'm going to have to do something if I if I allow that to sink in. Yeah, and I don't want to do anything. It's not a philosophical disagreement. It's just a fear. His, historically, thinking back to the founders, thinking back to the creation fear. of the United States of America out of uh, this disparate set of colonies, what was the percentage of people who were actually in support of the revolution? Uh, that's been bannered around 3% to 30%. 3% fought. It's pretty interesting if you go back further with... Uh, I love history. <laughs> Dave gave me a book. I love it. Conceived in Liberty. I will cherish it 
I hold it in my hands and I rub it and okay, I kiss it because right, I love this book. It's a fantastic book. It seriously is one of the best books I've ever read. Not just on history. It teaches you economics. It teaches you philosophy. It teaches you everything that you should want to know. And the colonies originally, I mean, Philadelphia colony, those people were 100, everyone in the colony were revolutionaries. They were the patriots at the time, not because they were, and not because they were fighting for their government. You know why? They had none. They could not be taxed. They had these guys come in and said, I'm your governor. You will pay quantrants to me, quit rents to me. You will pay me taxes. You will pay this. You will pay that. And they said, yeah, not so much. And they refused to pay over and over. And you know what they did? They jumped in their ships and they went back to England and said, these guys will not pay us no matter what we do. And then they come back and they try again. East and West New Jersey, the same thing. Everyone there said, no, we do not give our consent to be conscripted to war. They refused to send anyone to the militias. Refused. No one would go. At all. They refused to give their money. This is very interesting, I think, for people today that are against wars, and I'm guilty of it too. They refused to even let their tax money go. If there was a war, they said, nope, we're not paying a tax because if any dime of this goes, it's just as much as if we went and killed the person ourselves. If any dime of our money goes to fight this war, it's the same as us pulling the trigger. They refused to do it. They refused to be taxed. We have a great historical background of refusing to give consent and it's too bad that we don't know it now because that is the answer what shall we do refuse to give consent i really believe that and historically we have the precedent for it but where do i know the end of another show guys thanks for being here dave good luck down in uh the other farms that you're going to visit here, the yep, other starting ta- with the Canadian farm, yeah, man, the other tax farms, and please, a lot of them have a lot of holes in the fence, and a very lazy farmer, which is great. Please continue to I call like in and, uh, and help prod these animals to look for the holes in our fence. <laughs> Definitely. All Definitely. right, we will be back again next week at uh, 9 a.m. for another edition of the Shadow Dominion Wake Up Call. This has been Patriots Lament right here on KFAR Local Talk Radio 660 on your AM dial.